So I think I'm not seeing a bunch of people popping into the waiting room yet. Uh, I'm sure more people will join us, but I know we've got a lot to get through on this one. So um, yeah, we'll just go ahead and get started. And this is all, again, you know, as always with these, this is being recorded. This will be put up on our YouTube channel later. So if anybody joins us a little late uh, or if anybody on the call right now needs to duck out a little early, the whole meeting will be available probably today or tomorrow uh, on Barbara's on Lighting's YouTube channel. So easy enough to catch up on that. So with that in mind, uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. Uh, we're excited. This is either our ninth or our 11th. This is our ninth this year, 11th overall Zoom and Lumens. Uh, so we missed Big Ten, but we're excited to keep doing this. We're excited to keep having these opportunities and partnering with these manufacturers. It's great to have Altman with us today. Uh, and so, yeah, with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jake from Altman and let you go from there. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Ned. Hey, everybody. Uh, so yeah, my name is Jake Rhodes. I'm a product sales specialist here at Altman Lighting. Um, and I got some pretty cool uh, stuff with me here to show you today. Um, you know, we're not going to really turn a lot of fixtures on and show everything because it doesn't really look good over Zoom, but we're going to talk about everything and, uh, and provide some pretty in-depth details. Um, when I'm going through different uh, fixtures, I'll go ahead and paste uh, basically uh, different things in the chat, uh, whether it be videos or uh, links to a product page. So if you want some more information or you want to take a look at it and follow along, feel free to do so. Um, so overall today, what I have, um, my three main things I'm focusing on here is our Hydra, aka our IP200 unit, our Phoenix 3 ellipsoidal, and this is actually the Zoom version. And we all, I also have down here a, our work light, uh, which is our work light two, which just came out about two months ago. Um, for my front lighting here, I'm using a Nimbus Halo, which is an Altman product, basically a live streaming circular light. And behind me, I got a Spectre Psych 200 and a Spectre Psych uh, 50 UV to pop this Hydra poster that's behind me here. So I got a lot of cool stuff with me today. Ned, is there anywhere you would like to start in particular first? No, I mean, however, however you want to go through it works fine for me. I will say, folks, uh, if you've got questions through all of this, because everybody's muted and your cameras are off, uh, please just go ahead and drop them in the chat. And then I'll bring them up as, as we get going here and make sure that everything gets addressed. So if you've got questions about the fixture that's currently being shown, if you've got fixtures about something else, uh, yeah, I mean, if we can speak intelligently about it, we'll try to answer. <laughs> yeah, intelligently. That's always the struggle, right? <laughs> All right. So, you know what? I'm just going to start with uh, our brand new unit, uh, our work light two, because um, it's also relatively simple to explain. Um, so our work light two is talking about what it is. It's a work light. Um, so on top of that, it's a very, very bright work light and has a really great high quality of light. Everything that you would want in a performance lighting system, we've taken and put it on a work light. Um, so a little bit of some facts about this guy. It's uh, a 90 watt engine. And compared to our work light one, it's a, we've actually lost a lot of power. So our work light one was 130 watts and our work light two is 90 watts. And most people would be like, well, why? Why would you want it to be less power? But that's because we have basically a new generation uh, Cobb chip in this unit. I'll actually take the filter out since we're not going to be turning it on. This is just a little diffusion filter that comes with the unit to help uh, diffuse the light coming out of it. But yeah, we have a nice little circular Cobb chip there, 90 watts. Um, so we are losing a little bit of wattage. But that's a good thing in this case because the work light one was 130 watts that pushed out 10,000 lumens. This guy's 90 and it pushes out 14,000 lumens. So not only are you gaining 4,000 lumens of brightness, you're also going to be uh, taking away your total wattage draw. So it's kind of a win-win in that kind of situation. Uh, another really big feature about this work light two that is different from the work light one is that it's uh, dimmable. Um, and I will say the dimming is non-performance dimming. So if you're familiar with uh, our Pegasus 6 and 8-inch Fresnel and some other uh, products that can uh, basically triac dim, 
uh, they are super, super smooth. But in work lights, we don't, we're not going necessarily going to be doing 10, 30, or really any second fade out at all. They're really just meant to glow them at 10% while you're doing a backstage scene change or to blast them at full to do overall brightness on a stage. So on the back of the unit, there's a little uh, basically dial on it. So you can dial in to whatever brightness you want and you can relay it on and off from there from a relay panel. Or you can also plug this into your existing dimming architecture. So which, that's really cool um, through that process of being able to use a standard dimmer to control an LED fixture. One, that's a big deal. And uh, two, it allows us to use that existing architecture that is in almost all theaters, unless you've just brand new built it, um, in order to control the dimming on this light. Um, other than that, it's a 100% single source, and it has, I believe, like a 120-degree beam angle. I mean, as you can see, it's a very shallow reflector, so it just blasts light over the place. And with those 14,000 lumens, it's a very, very high-quality, high-bright uh, work light. Um, and since it is single source, we also do sell an optional barn door accessory if, uh, if you wanted to get some light off of your, uh, I guess, some of your curtains in the theater. Um, let's see, what else? Um, other than that, it is power cons, ins and outs, so you can jump them as well. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much the work light. The, oh, the only other thing, which is actually the same in the work light one, it's also convection cooled. So you don't have to worry about any fans going out or these making any noise. Um, so yeah, that's our work light, work light two. Uh, you can go ahead and there's a link in the chat if you want to check that out. Very simple, but very powerful and effective fixture um, with a really high quality of CRI. This is the 3000 Kelvin version. We also make it in a 5000 Kelvin version. Uh, and then the 3000 Kelvin version has a CRI of around uh, oh, plus 90. I think it's realistically around 92. Um, so what that means is that basically if you are doing any onstage work, building painting sets or anything else like that, uh, the colors and your quality of light is still gonna be accurately reflected when you know working uh, with the EVs units on or working with your performance lights on. Um, other than that, yeah, that's, uh, that's the work light too. If you guys have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll get to them. Ben, any, anything you want to talk about before we jump over to something else? No, again, as, as stuff comes in the chat, I'll bring it up, but for right now, I'm not seeing Perfect. anything yet. So if you want to move on to the next. Awesome. Um, let's go, let's go ahead and move on to my next fixture here. And this is my Phoenix three. This to talk, I want to talk a little bit about the Phoenix line in general. Um, the two main options, a part of our Phoenix line is going to be our Phoenix one and our Phoenix three. And they both fill very important aspects and different, they're meant for different things. So the Phoenix one is a 150 watt uh, LED engine. So you're not going to be pushing out as much brightness as this is, which we will uh, talk about that in a second. However, you are still getting uh, a very, very adequately bright fixture, but it's completely convection cooled. So we're not going to get any noise running from the unit. So there's no fans, the one to go bad in it. And two, there are no fans to make any noise. So for any of those areas um, or orchestra halls that are very decibel sensitive, um, the, the Phoenix one's a great option and is one of our best selling Phoenix fixtures. And again, that's for medium, about medium throw distance because of that 150 watt chip. So now we have our short to medium throws, convection cooled Phoenix One, and that's great and dandy. But for a lot of our theaters, uh, especially our bigger performance centers that are easily throwing 75 feet from the back of house, if not more, we need a lot more umph. And that's where the Phoenix Three comes into play. So the Phoenix Three is a 350 watt RGBL engine, and that's the only type of engine that comes with the Phoenix Three. The Phoenix One has a bunch of different uh, engines, you can look them up online. But the Phoenix 3, that RGBL, and, which stands for obviously red, green, and blue, and then lime. Uh, the lime is something that is actually relatively new to the lighting industry. And a lot of manufacturers are including it into their units because it helps fill a really important 
uh, part of the spectrum. And on top of that, it helps us basically mix to white better and push out a lot more lumens and have a high quality, higher quality of light. So you'll see a little bit uh, better CRI or TM30 out of this unit with the line chip in it, as opposed to an RGBW or RGBA chip. So while you necessarily wouldn't use the line to light anybody up on stage, unless, unless you're trying to say they, they have liver failure, they got jaundice, <laughs> but when you mix to white, it absolutely makes a very, very nice cool white. Whereas other fixtures, you put them full on and they can be a little bit red. They're, it's not a good, a good, it's not a usable full-on, so you have to dial back a lot more. But our full-on is a nice, cool white, and then you can dial it back just a little bit, not as much as you would see from other different types of units. Um, so yeah, that RGB L, and, and specifically the L, is kind of what makes this unit it magic pop. On top of that, something else different that we do than a lot of other different manufacturers is that we're only spitting, splitting our chip into four different colors. So that 350 watt is only being divided four times as opposed to five, six, all the way up to eight in some other different units in the industry. So essentially that allows our saturate colors of red, green, blue to be very, very intense and to carry over long distances. Um, that being said, that's kind of the Phoenix engine itself. Um, the one, as opposed to the Phoenix One, though, the Phoenix Three does have fans in it. Except um, a lot, many people, many people are familiar with our Phoenix Two. Uh, our Phoenix Two, compared to our Phoenix Three, we've actually completely re-engineered the entire heating and uh, the entire cooling system to expel heat from the LED, which is why we're able to. Uh, put a lot brighter of a chip in there. But essentially what that means for you guys is that uh, when the fan does kick on, it's super quiet. And when it does kick up to even at its highest value, it's tolerable, especially if you're running this on stage next to moving lights. But in reality, uh, the most demos I take this on and most people I showed it to are very okay with the loudest noise on there. And then you also via RDM or the back of the unit can adjust different, uh, different types of fan speeds from there if you are really being sensitive about it. But long story short, the, the cooling has been completely redone and it's very, very effective at taking away the heat from the engine, allowing the fan not to kick on as often. And we've also put a better quality fan in it so it's not as loud. Um, other than that, that's pretty much the engine. However, the Phoenix line is more, I mean, don't get me wrong. The engines are very, very important when it comes to an ellipsoidal. But, you know, the one thing for me, because I was a, uh, before I started in the lighting manufacturer industry, I was a theatrical mass electrician. So for me, it's, yeah, woohoo, the light's bright. That's great. But sometimes it can be more about the smaller things and about working with the light than necessarily the engine. And the Phoenix 3 has a lot of those small things that add up to make a big deal or to save you time. Um, just the starting on the bottom and kind of working my way up the fixture. If you don't have power cables plugged in, even with the clamp, so that I have a little stand with the bolt here, the fixture can swing completely underneath the base, which is really nice. You don't have to take the clamp off or throw it, throw it back on when you're trying to mess with it, uh, you know, when you're actually loading into a theater. Um, secondly, on the side here, there uh, on my yoke, I have a, not that you can see it, uh, take a look on our website if you want to see it better. We have a short yoke position and then a regular yoke position. So if you're ever in situations where you might be able to utilize a short yoke or you don't want to have to yoke a fixture out, there's a lot of different reasons you might want to, including really crazy installation uh, applications. You can short yoke it and put the whole fixture here and, and save you some time and not having to reach out and yoke, yoke the fixture out. Um, going up from here, we have a really nice, uh, basically, it's still a pressure lock system, but the pressure lock is really nice, especially when you get these zoom units, there's a lot more weight than a fixed lens, uh, but they hold, they hold uh, the weight really nicely. That's just a small feature. But uh, moving forward, our shutter, this is, can, this is the same from our zoom fixtures and our fixed lens fixtures. The shutter assembly completely rotates 360 degrees. Um, and there's these little uh, threaded screws in here that hold it together. 
So uh, one, it's nice because you don't have to worry about the whole lens of the thing popping off if someone doesn't tighten down your knobs well. <laughs> but on top of that, whenever you're actually using the light and trying to, you know, get your shutter to one, just line up at the side of the stage, and then you're just rotating your barrel from there, uh, not the barrel, that's a 64, rotating your, uh, your shutter assembly from there, Sometimes you'll, you'll get right to that line and you just can't hit it. But with the Phoenix 3, you can just rotate 360 all day long and it'll, it's fine with it because of how we've engineered it. Um, so instead of having to, you know, getting 45 degrees and ah, that's as far as I can go, having to completely move around the fixture to the other side, um, you can just rotate the barrel as much as you want. Small things, that's a big deal. Um, on all of our, I'll take this one off of my little service hatch here. All of our accessory slots, so here on the top for uh, the motorized iris, motorized gobo rotator, you know, everything that could go in your accessory slot. The accessory slot itself has, where's my camera? There it is, thumb screws. So no more when you're up in a lift 35 feet in the air, plus no more having to, uh, you know, take a tool up there, a Phillips head screwdriver or your whatever and having to undo it that way there's nice quality thumb screws up there again super nice um, and this actually isn't a feature on our zoom lenses but for our fixed lenses we have this uh, basically little plastic tab on the left and right of the fixture right in front of the shutter assembly and what that does is Normally the tabs are hanging down and doesn't do anything, but when you pull them up, they get tight. And what they do is they put pressure on the actual plates of the shutter assembly. So there's three different plates in our shutter assembly and they put pressure on them. And what that does is it's not a hundred percent a lock, but it's more of a, you know, reassurance that your one shutters aren't going to be ghosting. It helps lock them in there. So they don't move. Um, ghost shutter ghosting happens when, uh, your shutters are too smooth and it's sometimes a new fixture and they're permanently installed and sometimes your shutter will slowly to sink. Um, but with that lock, it doesn't, that won't happen because you're pushing, you're putting pressure on those plates so they don't move. On top of that, um, like as most people do, and I think personally, some of the best applications for a color changing ellipsoidal is for dance or even theaters that run booms. Um, so there's a saying in this industry, they're called shin kickers, and I'm sure West Coast to East Coast, they're all called different things, but essentially, you know, dancers or anybody walking in off stage can't see the actual units, and they'll give them a nice good kick with their shin as they're coming off. The same, those plastic tabs that help lock the tab, those plastic tabs that help lock the shutters in are also really great for applications like that, where you don't want somebody accidentally just brushing up against your, sh your shutter uh, flag here. Um, and it can help just lock it out, make it, yes, shin busters, exactly. That's another saying from it as well. Um, so again, small things add up to be a big deal. And this is another feature on the Phoenix 3 that's not represented, represented, re represented there we go, by our zoom fixture here is actually going to be on the front. Um, so on our, zoom, uh, on our zoom lens, it's actually just going to be these standard three clips with a locking press and uh, press to the side and flip up for your gel holder. But on our fixed lenses, we have a completely enclosed square uh, shutter, uh, not shutter assembly, but lens. So one, that's really nice just for providing safety and it's fully enclosed. So if you are still using IQ scanners or still wanting to put something in front of the the lenses uh, of your lens tube, it's going to hold that really nice. But two, it almost acts as a somewhat of a top hat, uh, a built-in top hat, really, and it helps eliminate all light leak coming out of the fixture. So that we've seen a lot of success in our fully enclosed lens tubes um, to the point where we're seeing even more of them in the market or the industry nowadays. Um, so as you can see in front of me, this is obviously our, 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 third, our zoom fixture. This one's a uh, 15 to 35 degree. However, everything from the, from the actual uh, housing, it's engine housing itself. So basically the shutter assembly forward is all interchangeable, just like how other industry standard fixtures are. Um, so basically I could just take this whole uh, set the whole lens, so the whole zoom portion of it off and put on my fixed engine just like that. 
and it, they're the same. So all these accessories are the same for the Phoenix One and the Phoenix Two. And uh, for our fixed shutter or fixed lens uh, ones, so 19, 26, 36, 50 degree lens tubes, they're all industry standard. So if you already have an in inventory of 200 or 150, 26 degree lens tubes, um, you can put them in our, our regular uh, shutter assembly uh, for fixed lens tubes and they'll work just fine. Uh, so don't worry if you want to upgrade to something like this, like especially for damp, like we were talking about earlier, you don't have to buy a whole new inventory of accessories. Um, let me see here. I think that's about it. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a couple other small things in here, like integrated safety cable, but for the Phoenix, that's pretty much the grand scheme of things. Um, so brightness wise, the Phoenix three, outputs anywhere from 10 to around 12, almost 13-ish thousand lumens. And that depends on which lens you have. The, the, the zoom lens are actually optically a little bit more efficient than the fixed lenses. So you'll see a little bit more brightness out of there, but still 10 to almost 13,000 lumens is a lot of light, especially for an ellipsoidal. So again, super bright output for super long throws, super saturated colors, and uh, a great mix to white capability with a average CRI anywhere from 82 to 87, depending on your Kelvin temperature, which is very adequate for a color changing unit. Um, yeah, I think, I think that about covers our Phoenix 3. And of course, uh, it's all, uh, other things that are inside the unit. Uh, we have multiple different profiles, 16 bit, 8 bit dimming, um, power con ins and outs data five pin data ins and outs so pretty much everything you would expect from a uh, you know a but basically newer ellipsoidal like this um you get it and i actually should, probably shouldn't call it an ellipsoidal because it is an led it actually doesn't have an ellipsoidal reflector so i should be calling it a profile and that's what it is a profile <laughs> um yeah so that is our phoenix three uh, moving so on you to a little bit about the sorry, real quick. You talked a little yeah. bit about the fan um, that is in the, the the Phoenix three unit. Can you speak a little bit to when that fan does turn on, or when you're making a choice about lowering the fan intensity? What kind of output sacrifice? So, anytime you are using a, a low fan mode, you're going to be decreasing the output of the fixture to around seventy percent. And, you know, on other fixtures, that can be detrimental. But with the Phoenix 3 being so bright, even dimming it down to 70%, one, you're probably never going to run these fixtures in most applications above 70%, unless you're on your really, really long throw applications. Um, but, yeah, so if you want to run that lower fan mode, if you are concerned about fan noise, uh, low fan mode settings are in the menu or triggerable over RDM. Um, so even if like, if you're, you know, if you're really the console programmer, if you wanted to in the middle of the show, you can create an RDM macro, basically to switch it into low fan mode whenever you would want to, and then switch it right back into auto fan mode. So you won't lose that output. So if you do have uh, quiet settings on stage, you can remotely trigger it if you really want to. Um, the fan, uh, other than that, I've had this thing on for quite a while and it doesn't trigger. When it does turn on, it usually has a little bit of a, not blast, it turns on just for a little bit and it cools the LED because of all our thermal regulators inside of it really uh, monitor the heat of our LED and it only turns on when it has to. So I've only seen the fan turn on maybe a handful of times out of all the demos I've done with this unit. Um, even leaving it on almost full on, like basically in like a 3200 or, or a 4500 Kelvin, leaving it for almost two hours and coming back and it wasn't blaring. So um, other than that, yeah, like I said, it does have a fan, so it will put some people off just be because of that. Um, but I will say that you probably shouldn't be worried about it unless you're in a recording or studio or an orchestra type of application. And then like we were talking about earlier, if you are concerned about that, then you have, we have our Phoenix One line, which is convection cool, which is completely silent. So um, in that case, you might just need to have to get an extra uh, unit or two to have the same kind of coverage. 
Now that's what's nice about having a bright fixture like this is that you can get the same amount of luminous coverage on stage without having as many units. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Anything else, Ned? No, I just I wanted to, to dig down a little bit more on that. So again, folks, if you have any questions on anything, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, and yeah, if you want to move on to the, to the Hydra. Hydra, yeah. So our Hydra par, which has honestly been the hit. It's, been, it's our number one star on pretty much all of our demos. Uh, everybody, uh, this unit is very well received and um, it's very well built. And we're pretty proud of this unit, especially in the evolution of grand scheme of Altman and what we've done in the past, well, even the last uh, five years ago, you know, um, I'm thinking like basically our, uh, our Spectrosyc series, which I'm running back behind me, like the type of technology that's in that, and that was that released in 2008 versus the technology that we have in our Hydra part here, which just released about five months ago. It's insane. Um, so let's talk about the reasons why people um, are specking this par and why people like it and why it's so versatile. So I'm just going to start throwing out some bullet points and we'll dive into each one of those bullet points. Um, so my Hydra par, aka AIP 200, that's the part number, aka, um, it's a 200 watts RGBL IP65 convection cooled zoom par. Um, so let's dive into all of those things. Um, so first I said 200 watt RGBL engine. So basically we have uh, 12 emitters here driven by 200 uh, watts, basically uh, overall power consumption. And they're gonna be red, green, blue, and lime LED. So the same type of color mixing principles we were talking about with our Phoenix, getting more output, getting better quality of flight, um, is going to be this, uh, it's going to be the same uh, conversation with Hydra. On top of that, um, again, when you put it full on, it's a very nice, not really cold white, but I would say probably around a 7,000, maybe 8,000 Kelvin. So it's a usable full on as opposed to um, some other types of uh, par um, on the grand, but basically other types of pars in the industry, you, you can't really use full on. It can be a little pink or the colors aren't very off. So we're able to actually utilize that full, full power of the fixture. And uh, since we're talking just general uh, lumens, uh, the, the hydro par on the right zoom uh, range, the brightest is gonna be pushing out in full on, is gonna be pushing out 5,000 700 lumens. So uh, nothing to scoff at, at such a small profile par as this is. And we'll, I'll get more into size and weight in a second here. Um, so engine, we talked about it. Next up was IP65 rating. So um, a, great, a quick description of IP rating stands for ingress protection. Um, then the first number and the second number mean completely different things, right? So technically everything has an IP rating. My little uh, Nimbus I'm using up front here, which isn't outdoor rated, but still has an IP rating of 20, which means it has some protection against dirt and no protection against water. Um, my Hydra part here, like I said before, has an IP rating of 65. So six is fully sealed against any type of particulates, dirt, dust, sand, basically even the finest things cannot get inside of this unit. And then my second number is five, which means it can take up to medium jets of water. So any type of at outdoor applications, uh, these will be perfectly fine for temporary installation. Uh, and for permanent installation, um, sometimes it's a little bit different, but we have something we're working on and maybe we'll be able to show in a little bit later. Uh, not today, but in a couple of months, we'll see. But uh, we'll have a solution for you as well for permanent installations. Uh, however, uh, the IP65 rating has been most of the time more than enough for, I would say, 95% of environments, uh, especially uh, for a lot of like production companies that want to pick this up. You're never going to have an issue with it. 
you get super uh, dirty and dusty. I'm from California, so we have a bunch of festivals out in the middle of the desert. So getting gear that comes back from those is usually miserable, especially non-IP rated gear. But with your hydropar, one, if it gets rained on, oh, well, somebody, you know, gets it all muddy. Oh, no. At the end of the day, you can just put it off, put it on the floor of your production studio or not studio, but your production warehouse and just hose it off and it'll be fine. Again, so that's medium jets of water. So you can't power wash it and you cannot submerge it. Uh, but it's, again, outdoor rated. So it's uh, designed to be rained on um, and stormed on. So it's okay for that. Um, so, yeah, that was IP65. Um, convection cooled. So just like we were talking about with our Phoenix 1 being convection cooled and all the benefits that and all the benefits you get from that and on top of that uh, why people like it and, and spec convection cooled units is because it has little to none operational noise so our phoenix oh my phoenix my hydropar here um if you can see it has little uh probably be better to look it up on the 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 link that was posted in chat However, it has uh, basically ridges along the whole side of the body here. Essentially, the whole body of the fixture is its heat sink. Uh, so it's, pulling, it's using these fins and the metal that is in the, the actual body of this unit to pull heat out of the LED engine and to cool it. Um, so it's fully sealed and on top of that, it's convection cooled. So it basically, it's completely silent operation. And again, there's nothing going to be getting inside of this light. Um, so some of the reasons, um, when we talked about outdoor and why it's important to have IP65 ratings outdoor, but uh, IP65 ratings for indoor installations are, can also be equally really important. Um, like I said before, I was a basically freelance mass electrician and uh, I, can, I can tell you that it definitely is not fun taking apart a whole theater's inventories of ellipsoidals and having to clean every single lens and dust out the fixtures of 200, 150 to 200 fixtures, depending on the theater. It's not fun. <laughs> I'll tell you that. With IP65 units, especially like our hydro park here, that convection cooled, there's literally no access to the insides of this fixture. Um, are such an easy low maintenance option. So in theaters, we have a lot of dust, a lot, a lot of dust for some reason. They're usually more dusty than anywhere else I've ever been. But on top of that, you sometimes, depending on your show, you can be using a lot of haze. I know I did Rock of Ages show um, at Summerstock when I, I did Summerstock. And I remember the fixtures that were close to all the, the hazers, and we did a lot of haze that show. But we almost have to clean the lenses uh, probably every week because of how much haze we would be getting onto those lenses. And now with this IP65 rating, we're not going to get any of that dirt and dust inside the fixture. We're not going to get any of that haze to cloud up the lens or anything else like that. So you don't uh, maintenance is almost little to none. Like I was saying before, instead of having to take apart 100, 200 fixtures, you can take this outside duster can it off and then wash it off if it's really that dirty or dusty i should say um so outside great totally fine for using that and indoors as well it's had a lot of great benefits all right um another really important feature about this and i would say it's probably the most important feature is it has a zoom range so um long story short the zoom is broken down into two different parts a uh beam mode and a wash mode, but those are switchable over RDM. There's even a control channel. And um, in reality though, I, put, use, I usually use wash mode the most. And that's because uh, the, the grand scheme of the zoom is 6.5 to 50 degrees. Uh, beam mode is 6.5 to 32 and wash mode is eight to 50. I normally use 8 to 50 because the difference between 6.5 and 8 is really kind of just the fuzz on the edge of the beam. So if you're going to be doing any like trust applications or actually want to see the beam, use the beam mode all day. And again, that's super easy to trigger it. But wash mode is what I have the fixture in right now has 8 to 50 degrees of zoom range, which is phenomenally insane. 
Um, so you get, you know, eight degrees. So that again is more for almost spotting down on stage for intense moments. We're talking like real theatrical design or for production companies. We have a lot of uh, trees out here. I'm based in Los Angeles. So uh, palm trees, excuse me. So if you wanted to basically, you know, light a palm tree up almost all the way to the top, we have that narrow beam to do so. However, if we're just talking about lighting spaces efficiently, um, have, being able to either go from, you know, 32 degrees, 40 degrees, or 50 degrees simultaneously is a super big deal. So you can take this in one space, set it up, you're done. Like we were talking about true rental applications, super versatile and going in between spaces. But even for permanent application, permanent installation applications, the Zoom is real, still really effective because you're not locked behind different filters or different uh, basically manual zoom ranges. You can, um, we're not getting into the intense programming part of it, but you know, the zoom has a range of zero to 255 when you're in like in a console. So you can dial in that zoom range anywhere between there instead of just uh, narrow, medium and wide, or, you know, basically all your regular park hand lenses. You can set it to exactly 198 out of 255 and you're done. So, so we talked about like why the zoom is nice. On top of that, we have something that's actually patented in this fixture and with Altman. Um, it's essentially a hardware zoom lock. So what the hardware zoom lock does, and it's trigger, triggerable from the back of the console or the back of the fixture and on the console, essentially completely disconnects the powertrain to the entire, um, entire zoom uh, hardware. Let's just put it like that, that. So normally when you have a moving head or any type of fixture that is motorized, you'll go through a calibration setting, uh, powering up and powering down. Um, and, and including this uh, power will do the same thing if it's not locked. However, if you want to set it in for it to never move again, that's what the hardware lock is really for. So uh, in other lights that don't have a motorized zoom, um, you will be getting that zoom level from a console or from the manual on the back of the uh, unit, manual mode. And that's, that's usually fine and dandy and great. However, um, you know, we see a lot, especially with our theme park applications that are relaying on and off power two to three times a day, multiply that by every single day day of the year other than like how five days when theme parks are closed if that multiply that by three two to three years and all of a sudden that 127 dmx level it which should be here is now going to be here or here or here somewhere in between there as things you know as the uh, hardware gets older and, and depending on the type of zoom if it's belt or pulley or whatever uh, you start to see a little bit of play in that zoom lens but with our, our, our lockout feature here, it will never move ever again. So you set it on day one and it, it won't power up and down. It won't recalibrate, it won't move. It's essentially done, moved right there. And uh, basically the whole drivetrain of the Zoom is on big metal uh, set screws basically. Um, and what my point is, is that if you have it locked for years, it's not going to have an issue unlocking. Um, basically, uh, you can unlock it and it'll start working again, no problem, because of the, the, uh, the way the Zoom uh, mechanic is designed. So for, for your, uh, your permanent installations, that's a great option because you can set it to exactly where you need it to and lock it. So nobody will mess with it ever again. So that's the one thing that a lot of people in the lighting industry, uh, it's hard to work with is making things dummy proof. You want stuff to be really advanced and sophisticated. So for people that, you know, are, we call, we call them qualified technicians can get in there and recalibrate the color settings and color calibration and all these other things that are important to do for people that know how to do them. But at the same time, uh, for instance, I like to use house of worship, for example, a lot of times house of worship will have, you know, your one or two lighting or technical directors that know all the ins and outs of the gear, but then they have volunteers come in and work and work the plots and work the stage for whatever events, mass, whatever they're doing. And that lockout feature is really nice because 
basically once you set your once you set your whole uh, basically lighting design, it's not going to be ruined by someone accidentally going in there and messing with the zoom. All right, I think that's enough <laughs> on the zoom. I I, I just want to stress that it's really important and it's one of the best the biggest selling factors. Uh, of this unit, being able to utilize that. Um, let's see here. So we talked about the engine, we talked about the zoom, we talked about its IP65 rating, convection cooling, um, some other small things. Like again, for me, sometimes the small things can add up to be big things. Uh, we have, this comes with the unit, however, it does not come with it on. So there's four little uh, Allen screws here on the front of the lens. Uh, you can attach this or detach this, depending if you want to or not. You can uh, basically put either uh, gel or basically a type of LSF in here. Um, so the beam by itself is very circular. So for some applications, you might want to extend it horizontally or vertically, depending on how you're hanging it. Um, so you can basically put your uh, it's a standard seven inch accessory slot. So you can put in your uh, gel with a basically type of uh, an LSF filter in there, allowing you to uh, extend it one way or the other. Or on top of that, and this is probably the most practically used, it, you can put a top hat on here. So if you don't want the audience or anyone to see um, the actual lensing of itself, you don't want to see the glare on the fixture, you can use a, seven, a standard seven inch top hat top hat and put it on in there. And like I said, it's removable if you don't want it to be on there. If you actually want some of the eye candy, eye candy look, uh, you can. Um, and one last thing about hardware before we talk about some other stuff, like uh, menus and stuff inside this unit, is that this has a scissor yoke. So that I don't, this is the only fixture in front of me I don't actually have on the stand. And that's because it com comes with a scissor yoke. And that's super nice for um, theater production companies, really anyone that wants to put gear outside and set it up super quickly or on the side of a stage, you know, anywhere. <laughs> um, so a couple things internally inside this fixture that make it, uh, well, a state-of-the-art type of fixture is we have pretty much everything in here imaginable. And uh, I won't, I can't show you here, but the menu of this unit is super well done and refined. It uh, has a touch screen sensitive buttons and there's even color, not color, there's even scrolling animations when you hit enter. It, I, I'm a gear nerd. So whenever someone does a really nice menu, I geek out over it. But other things in that menu, um, just listing them off the top of my head, you have uh, tungsten, uh, not tungsten, you have uh, yeah, tungsten simulation, which is basically uh, simulating the dimmingness, the dim glow out of a, uh, 2000 watt all the way to a 750 watt tungsten. You have your, all your pulse width modulation, AKA uh, frequent LED frequent refresh settings or frequency settings. So uh, they're camera friendly. Um, we have uh, a whole channel for color. Uh, what's the right word? Color, not filters, but presets. There it is, color presets. So you have all your basically, excuse me, you have all your gel uh, colors in there um, that we've mapped, at pretty much all of them that you can think of, all the really common ones. And then on top of that, you also have your built-in dynamic light range. So we have presets for 27, I mean, yeah, 2700, 3200, 4000, 4500, all the way up to, I believe, eight or 10,000 Kelvin just in presets. And that's nice because then you don't have to sit there and mess with it and be like, oh, you know, this is too red or this has too much green, boop, press the one button and you've got your desired uh, Kelvin temperature. And they are very accurate. I've actually taken a light meter and tested them myself too, which is what, uh, you know, Altman does to all, all, everything we make. We thoroughly test a lot of stuff, all of our products, but uh, they're very accurate to what they say they are within around 30 degrees of Kelvin. So really important because a lot of other people will say, oh yeah, it does whatever Kelvin temperature. And you're like, that's not right. <laughs> um, but in that same uh, color preset, something that's even more important than all those rest of the things that I talked about is it has 20 user definable presets. So uh, basically in the control channel, and we'll talk about control channel here in a second, um, there is a record preset one, record preset two, all the way down to 20, and then clear all presets as well. So for production companies or 
school, schools or whatever gear rental people that uh, find themselves using cut their own custom colors a lot. A lot. Um, one, most of the time you would just save that to a console, but for people that don't have one smart console or two, what, like production companies that just take this gear out and put it, you know, wherever, again, to light up a palm tree without having to run DMX to it, you can basically like in your shop or beforehand dial in all the colors that you might want and save those to a custom preset. Uh, so like for, or even for like schools, right? So for schools that invest in these for a system of backlight, you get a couple of spares, then you can save your own custom school colors and put them outside uh, for in your foyer or whatever to light up the space outdoors, or if you're having some type of fundraiser event, again, you can save 20 user customizable uh, color filters, I mean, color presets and have them be recalled right from the unit, or you can recall them from a console um, it's within the color preset channel or color, uh, yeah, color preset channel. Um, let's see what else. And then um, it also has a control channel. So you can pretty much, for the most part, control every single aspect of this light, you know, resetting, recalibration, all the way down to refresh settings, um, saving or clearing custom color palettes inside that control channel. Um, and in there, like we said, it has all the frequency settings. It's very in-depth and thorough and has all your options in there. Um, if you, or you can also RDM into the fixture. Everything in front of me is RDM enabled um, from the fixture. So you can adjust all your frequency yada yada settings from there. Um, let's see, I think, I think that's about it on this fixture. Oh, there's one last thing I forgot to talk about that's also really important. So this pit fixture weighs 13.8 pounds. And for most people that would be like, okay, yay, that means I don't have to throw as much weight on my rigging arbors or, or whatever. Uh, and one, that's nice. Two, it's not over and cumbersome to work with, you know, working just like putting it inside of cases and then out of trucks, whatever. And three, for us, that's really cool because it meets our minimum uh, weight capacity for SmartTrack. So SmartTrack is a basically track application with a power and data bus lined inside the track. And we have adapters for, for fixtures like this. And it has a maximum rating of 22 pounds per linear foot. This is well underneath that. So we can put a super bright, super versatile fixture uh, state of the art fixture really onto uh, track lighting, which before we would have to put, you know, you can't fit an ellipse full ellipsoidal on there. You would have to go with something smaller, something lighter. But with the Hydra, you're not compromising on brightness, zoom, or anything, but you can install it in a uh, smart track. And smart track is super versatile in what it can do and where it can be installed because it's like. Uh, for instance, let's go back to house of worship, right? A lot of churches, one, have been renovated from other spaces to be churches, and they don't have traditional uh, places to rig or hang lights on. So smart track is a great option for them. So we can just tap into their ceiling and secure it to, I'm not a contractor, so I can't tell you all the ins and outs of it, but you secure it up on top, and now you have a dedicated um a hanging application that gives you again power and data right from the track. Um, so for people that don't have real actual uh, hanging positions, this is a big win for them because now you can put a really awesome fixture on track anywhere. So yeah, that's uh, that's been Hydra. I think that's pretty much the X, Y, and Z about uh, about him. Um, so. Did you want to say something, Ned? Yeah, I just wanted to. So one thing you'd talked about a little bit was uh, on the Hydra, you've got these zoom modes, which is an RDM channel. The zoom itself is a DMX attribute, or that's yes. also set over RDM? Okay, great. Yes. So there's yes and yes to both those questions. So, um, so yeah, zoom is a DMX channel. Um, it's pretty much built into all of the different channel modes. There's a lot of them, but uh, it's controlled in there. Also on top of that, which is controlled, via, which you can trigger over RDM or on the control channel, it actually has pre-built in stops for 
a, a basically a par 64 lens. So you have your very narrow spot, narrow, medium fl flood, wide flood, and extra wide flood presets all built in to the uh, in the control channel. So you can trigger those remotely as well. So let's like if you're designing or um, you are um, like on our website, we have different IES files for different zoom modes. If you wanted to throw that in there into like a 3D visualizer or um, basically something to tell you like how far apart all my lights need to be, um, you can use those generic, uh, very narrow, whatever designs and then put this in place of it. So that can be a useful tool. And that actually reminded me on one other thing I didn't mention, which is also pretty cool, is all the different DMX modes that is inside the unit, AKA uh, profiles, as we call them. So we have a profile for compact, which is just RGB and intensity and strobe. So for people that just want saturate colors, like this is more production company that just want saturate colors and turn it on and off and strobe. We have those channels. We have what I have in now RGBL 16 bit. So it's 16 bit dimming and everything in there on the control channel, everything in there, controls, color filters, all that good stuff is in there. And there's a couple other ones, but the biggest one I want to highlight is also has CMY 16 bit and 8 bit emulation mode. So if you are a comp production company or even a theater running al these alongside of moving heads, again, CM moving heads or CMY color mixing, we have a CMY emulation mode that basically you can color mix your movers and this fixture at the same time. So you don't have to jump back and forth between RGB, W, RGB, whatever other fixtures might be WRA, RGBL in this one. You don't have to jump back and forth. You can just mix CMY at the same time, which is kind of nice because, uh, you know, programming, especially in production environments, is all about utilizing the time. If you're utilizing your time effectively and how fast you can do stuff, um, you know what I mean? And so without having to go jump back and forth, lots of different buttons you have to press, you can just, boom, mix CMY all day long. All right, there you go. There's the spiel. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, one, so I know availability is sort of the hot button issue for everybody in every sure. industry about everything right now. Um, what is lead time for this stuff? Is are these are all sure. these on the shelf? Is stuff? So you know that, like you said, that's a really hot topic. Uh, hot topic question. However, I I will uh, I got an email the other day that we actually do have Hydra in stock right now. So by the time this airs. Who knows, somebody can come on and submit a PO for 200 of them and they might not be in stock. But, um, but that's a great question of lead time. So generally, Altman, generally, we have, right now we have anywhere from a four to an eight week uh, lead time. Some stuff like our Genesis console, we can send out tomorrow. Other stuff uh, like our Phoenix, we are building to order. So um, yeah, four to eight weeks is a really good uh, rough guesstimation. But uh, what I have to say is, is get your orders in early and then that will really help us basically try to get you your gear as fast uh, as we can. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, people who don't really understand all the manufacturing delays that are plaguing our every industry right now. I mean, I can't even get a graphics card it's a different conversation, but it's, it's the same thing. So the delays that making graphics card delays, semiconductors and the same issues that make uh, delaying us delaying our units, manufacturing our units. Um, so yeah, four to eight weeks. Oh, that's where I was going with that. So a lot of people don't understand uh, what, where, 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 where the industry is at right now. And they'll say, oh, okay, I just, I finally just got my end of the year budget. I need to spend it or I lose it. Um, you know, I'm going to put my PO in for eight Hydras or eight Phoenixes, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, and then they say, okay, well, we need to build them. We need to have them by next week. That's virtually impossible. Um, some like Hydra right now, as we speak, we could probably make something happen, but just with the, how everything's going with delays, we need to, and this, I can say this for every manufacturer out there. You need to give our, us manufacturers a good amount of lead time because of how crazy the delays are. And one other thing I will speak to that is, and this is a little side tangent, I guess, 
But um, I live in Long Beach, so I'm, I'm a Long Beach local. And one of the biggest, uh, we in Long Beach, we have the biggest port on the West Coast, the port of Long Beach. And um, a lot of us manufacturers, uh, we get parts, heat sinks. We're a, you know, we get different things from everywhere in the world. So we have some, we have heat, a heat sink for one, for our spectrocyte line that comes from India. So for instance, you know, we make those here in the United States, but we get parts from elsewhere and different other things. So a big issue with that is, is even though we are a United States manufacturer, we still have to wait for all those boats to come in. And if you are from Long Beach or friends with some people on Facebook, you probably have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cargo ships uh, basically lined up outside the port. And those carry everything from, you know, dog toys to parts for us that we need to manufacture our fixtures. And the issue is, is not just they can't even unload them fast enough. They get stuck by customs, uh, ships are sitting out there for a lot longer. Um, for basically, right now, if you're familiar with California, there's cargo ships lined up all the way from the port of Long Beach all the way down to Orange County near like Bolsa Chica Beach. And I'm a Long Beach kid and it, I have never ever seen it that bad um there what did get bad a couple of years ago when the union workers uh when the, the workers at the dock went on strike but i'd say it's worse now than ever um and that's something that also hurts our industry like even us who, who, who some most of our fixtures uh, are 100 percent manufactured in the united states it hurts everybody so nobody's immune to manufacturing uh delays so keep that in mind and try to get your orders in early because we're going to try to build them and get you get them to you as fast as possible. So I would say four to eight weeks is a pretty good lead time for us compared to other manufacturer, other lead times I've heard from other people. So, and that's been uh, good for us too, because sometimes when, when it comes to some projects, it's who can ship. And that's the, that's, that's the deadline. That's the bottom line, I should say. Absolutely. No, it's definitely something we're seeing across the industry. It's not anything that's unique to anybody at this point. Um, so we're wrapping up pretty much here. We've got a couple more minutes left in the hour. Uh, there's one more question in the chat. Just if you can speak quickly to uh, MSRP or list price on the three fixtures in front of us. And then anybody uh, in the audience, um, if you've got more questions, you can go ahead and drop them in the chat. But yeah, if you quickly want to talk about just... so. Um Pricing, I, I, I don't, I want to talk about something else before we end. So I, all I have to say with that is, is reach out to your local Barbizon dealer. I can give you guys generic list pricing, but the issue is, is that uh, you really need to reach out to a dealer to get your price. Um, so uh, I would say look on that, or you can take a look on, a, look on an online retailer if you're familiar, because that would take too much time to go through everything. The last thing I want to talk about is this right here. And what I'm going to say is very simple and short. This is the Altman Genesis console. The way I like to put it is it's a basic fader board with technology to carry you into the 21st century. Um, it's super easy to use. It's super versatile. You can even control moving heads on it if you want. Um, but essentially is, you know, back in the day, this would be a hard, this would be one fader. This would be one fader. I mean, this would be one fixture. But uh, this, this console, like I said, allows you to program uh, and patch multi-parameter fixtures just like all the ones I had behind me. So if you're looking for an actual hardware console that's easy to use, easy to program, and kind of dummy proof, uh, aka easy for volunteers to use, this is a great option. Um, and like I said, they're in stock. We can ship them. Yeah. Awesome. Well, that's a good point on the pricing. So if anybody has specific inquiries, uh, just reach out to your, to your local Barbizon representative. We can absolutely help you out. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming out. These are always good fun to do. Thanks, Jake, and thanks, Altman, for, for joining us this time. Uh, and again, this will be posted on Barbizon's YouTube channel probably this week. Uh, so if you were a little bit late coming in uh, and you want to catch the top, it will be there soon. And we'll send out an email to everybody that registered with that link. So... Thanks again, everybody, uh, and we will see you next time.